Good morning. Today's scripture is found in John 17, verses 11 and 20 to 23. And just to give a little context, this is Jesus talking with his Father. When I return to you, my friends will be on this world, no world without being able to see me. So Father, guard them as they pursue the life that you gave them through me, so that they can be one heart and one mind as we are. I've guarded them while I've been here. And pray not only for my friends, but for the people who will believe in me because of what my friends have said about me. I need them all to become one heart and mind so that they can be with us just as you are, Father, one with me. Then the world could believe that you sent me and know that you were the one who gave me this glory that I gave them so that they can be unified in the way that we are. And as they mature in this unity, they will give this godless world proof that you sent me and that you love them in the same way that you love me. Good morning, church. Yes, it is still morning. Um, I would like to pray with you. God in heaven, here we are. To our human eye, this looks like an ordinary occurrence on this planet. A bunch of people getting together, seeing each other, chatting, having a meal afterwards. It happens a lot. But most of us, perhaps all of us, did not come here for an ordinary meeting, Lord. Yes, it's good for us to meet with one another, but we want to meet with you. Thank you for working through this service even before now so that that would happen. And I ask that you would continue to cause that to occur. May nothing hinder us from hearing you, seeing you, coming closer to you, being changed by you through the remaining time we have together. May the power of your word, the power of your spirit be upon us. Thank you for doing that. Not because we're worthy, but because your son is. And we pray for, for his work to become more and more effective in our lives, even at this moment, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you read the newsletter that came out. In the newsletter, I talked about how a lady who was interviewed by local reporters in her hometown on the very day of her 102nd birthday. 102. She was interviewed by these reporters, and among their questions was, what is one of the benefits of going past the century mark? And this lady, who still had her wits and her sense of humor about her, said, well, there really isn't any peer pressure. <laughs> I think I would have gotten along with that lady. Um, peer pressure. It could be a negative thing, right? But can it be a positive thing? Maybe, is this an example? If you like to read church directories, uh, you and I are of kindred spirit. Here's one of the church signs that I had come across. Is this positive or negative peer pressure? Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. I guess depending on how you read that, that could be negative or positive peer pressure, right? God intended for his church to help one another, right? He intended for his church to be unified. In fact, I would go so far as to say, this is what Jesus died for. Let's go back to the scripture reading today. Look at what, look at what God is saying here. What well, Jesus is saying to God the Father. I am no longer in the world, meaning I'm not... I'm not going to be a puppet of the world. I'm not going to be so greatly influenced by the surroundings anymore that are against you. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, meaning the disciples, those followers of his right then and there. The, I'll say the 11, because Judas wasn't really a follower, but the 11 and, and on. I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, your character, your strength which you have given me, that they may be, what? 
one even as we are one. Look at the next few verses. I do not ask for these only, that is the first century church, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. This is Jesus praying for you, Jesus praying for me. If we have come to faith, it's been through them. Down through the centuries, the chain reaction, the results, the domino effect of their witness. Also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. How many of us? All be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that they may, be, be, they may become part of the community of the Trinity, of this triune God, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Do you see a theme here? Yes. I in them and you in me, may they become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. What a tall order. You know, I, I look at that and I say, wow, Jesus, you prayed big prayers. As a pastor, I have, I have prayed, told God that I would be satisfied if my members just get along. <laughs> In my deeper moments of faith, I pray for us to work together. And in my deepest moments of faith, then I pray Jesus' prayer. Make us one. That's, that's more than just getting along. That's more than just working together. That we would be one on the big things. And through that oneness, what happens with the world? They come to know this God. When they see a people exhibiting the character of God, exhibiting this oneness, which comes about through what? Forgiveness, understanding, compassion, all these wonderful things. When they see a people exhibiting these characters, they can easily, more easily anyway, believe in a God who has those characteristics. Amen? Isn't that what Jesus is praying for here? This spirit of oneness, this thing of teamwork, we see it in many areas, not just in the church. We see it in many areas. We see it in business, for example. There are times, yes, when one corporation overtakes another corporation, simply kind of one corporation's greed and the other corporation's uh, bad circumstances being taken advantage of. But there are times when two flourishing companies get together because they believe it will benefit both of them and all their employees together. This idea of teamwork, a team spirit, unity happens in the business world. I recall a... Uh, 20 or so years ago, Fortune 500 uh, survey. You know, the Fortune 500 magazine looking at the top 500 corporations in America. And one of the questions that was posed to the HR directors, you know, the human resource and the personnel directors, those that have the authority to hire and fire, they were asked, what is the number one quality you look for in, in, a, in a prospective employee? When you do an interview, what's top drawer for you? And while they did mention things like punctuality, you know, knowledge, skill set, and so forth, the number one quality they looked for was the ability to get along with one another. That surface to the top, head and shoulders above all these other things. They, they basically were saying, look, we can train people to do a job better. We can give them more knowledge. That's in our toolbox. We can provide them. But it's hard to actually give somebody a team mentality. So if they don't come with it, they may not be hired. So we see it in business. What about politics? I'll pick on politics of almost 20 years ago versus politics of today. Otherwise, somebody's going to be tempted to corner me at the door and talk about some politician or some party today, and I don't, I don't really want that. But I was around, I was knowledgeable in 1996, and I was aware that Bob Dole had been nominated for the Republican candidacy for the office of the President of the United States back there in 96. I also came to discover through my research a little bit of background. See, his running mate wound up to be Jack Kemp. What is interesting is just eight days, just eight days before the Republican National Convention, you know, the big hoopla, rah-rah, cheerleader, let's go get them, we could do this, gain momentum, kind of a gathering that, that each party has. At the Republican National Convention, eight days before that big hoopla, Jack Kemp had not even been invited to speak there. 
In fact, anybody knowing, the rec knowing their backgrounds knew that Bob Dole and Jack Kemp disagreed on several things, several key issues. But the talking heads and the think tank within the Republican Party said, hey, look, we really have to put together a team that could garner the most votes. And Dole alone and somebody with just his agenda, or Kemp alone and somebody with his agenda, that's not going to cut it because both of them have followings and they don't all overlap. So if we put them together, we've got a better chance. And so for, well, here's what one Republican person said. He was a New York State representative at the time, Amory Houghton. He said, you don't hear any divisiveness right now. Most people are swallowing and saying, for the good of the cause, let's work together. Happens in business, happens in politics. Does it happen in sports, particularly team sports? I'm wondering, have any of you paid any attention to football a month or so ago? Can you tell me what happened? Now, if I really meant that question, instead of saying it rhetorically, you would wonder, okay, pastor, do you like live in a bomb shelter or what? Because who could live around Seattle and not know what just took place in the National Football League, right? But let's, okay, great. You know, we took the Super Bowl, we got the trophy, wonderful. But let's go back just one game. After the Seahawks, our Seattle Seahawks, had this wonderful season, they got through the playoffs, but the last team in the playoffs for them to play, the last hurdle for them to jump over to get into the Super Bowl, was their game with... Yeah, see, everybody knows that. San Francisco, our favorite team to play, right? Because they're our favorite team to beat. They are, they're our arch nemesis. They're our number one public enemy. So Seattle really wanted to win that game for two reasons. One is they want to beat their top rival. And number two, they want to get into the Super Bowl. So this is a huge game, and they're playing it right here, right? In our own CenturyLink stadium. And the crowd is there, and they're raising a ruckus. And if it had a roof on it, they'd be raising the roof. And, and they're there making all the decibels and all that stuff, right? And the game begins. We're all pumped. The team's pumped. The fans are pumped. Those watching on television, we're all pumped. And on the very first play, what happened? Our wonderful star quarterback, Russell Wilson, an incredibly likable young man, bobbles the ball, gets touched by this 49er guy. Actually, did you, you remember that? He kind of almost accidentally throws the ball behind him. And it's right near the goal. San Francisco gets the ball. They eventually score a field goal. First play of the game. Now I'm wondering, how many of you that watched that game noticed all the disdain and the hatred and the anger that was poured out from the other Seahawks onto Russell Wilson. Did you see that? Did you see how one guy came up from behind and kicked him right in the rump after that play? Did you see anybody running past him on the way to the sideline, kind of giving him a forearm right there in the side? Did you see any of that? Or did you look, did, did the camera lens show the sideline with other guys getting on Russell Wilson's face, telling him what an ignoramus he was? No, because in team sports, that's not what happens. See, in a team sport, we're, in a, we're a team. And just like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 about the physical body, using it as a metaphor for the church, when one member suffers, all the members suffer, right? I often use the example, you know, if I'm, and I've done this, when, you know, you're hammering a nail. You've had this experience. You're hammering a nail. You're holding it with one hand, hitting it with the other, and whack! You miscalculate, or the hammerhead glances the nail head, and bam, you hit your finger. Oh! And, of course, we all fight that temptation to utter words Jesus would never utter. So we're saying things like peanut brittle and belly button and whatever. And... But I'll tell you what none of us do. None of us take the hammer. The wounded hand does not take the hammer and then pound the offending hand, right? That just doesn't happen. I mean, if that is happening in your home, then see me after the service. I have a couple of phone numbers to give you. But, but that doesn't happen. See, if one member suffers, the other members go along, right? 
Right? That, that good hand is going to hold the other hand. Hold that thumb, right? You, your legs get involved. You hold it between your knees. Your, oh, your mouth gets involved, hopefully in a wholesome way. And that's what happens. Your ankle gets sprained. The whole body compensates. Your, your tail, you, you know, your whole spine, your other leg, right? Your other leg says, I'll bear more of the burden. You can't handle that right now. The spine says, okay, I'll tip this way so that not that much weight is on that injured ankle. See, that's how a team works. It's how it works in the Seattle Seahawks. It's how it works in every good team. It happens in business, happens in politics, it happens in sports. Shouldn't it happen in the church? The sooner in life we learn to think in terms of the plural pronoun we, the better our adjustment to living together in society will be, in our families, in our workplaces, and in our church, right? So when I think of, I ask myself the question now, what about the benefits? What how would we answer this question? Now, your answer may be different. I've come up with three things. What happens when we work together with a team spirit mentality and actually employ that in what we say and what we do and how we operate? Because this is what it's all about, to be one with God and through that unity be one with each other. What are the benefits? Now, I confess to you, I really like deep study. I like doing exegetical studies, and we've often done that, both Pastor Seth and I. You take a small passage of Scripture or a story, and you just delve into it and all that. We're not going to do that. I'm going to do something else that Jesus and Paul and other gospel writers did. Let's pull things from everyday life, as we've already done. You know, Jesus talked about business, a guy who wants to build a tower. He talked about farming, agriculture, right? Paul talked about sports, you know, running the race and so forth. So we're going to talk about those things. But it's to highlight that one scripture that's, that was our scripture reading today about becoming one in answer to Jesus' prayer. So what are the benefits of having unity and teamwork? It, really in any endeavor, but we especially want it in the church. One thing is, I believe, life becomes more valuable when you give something of yourselves to others. Life becomes more valuable when you live outside of your little container of self. I'm thinking of a story I came across actually about 30 years ago. And I know all of you are doing the math and you, so you figured out that I read it when I was about five or six. About 30 years ago, I came across this story in a magazine article, okay? It was a really cute story about two elderly women. They were both residents of the Southeast Senior Center for Independent Living in Inglewood, New Jersey. Their names were Margaret Patrick and Ruth Eisenberg. Margaret Patrick, you would think she was Irish, and maybe she did have some Irish, but Margaret was black. She had African-American roots. Ruth, on the other hand, Eisenberg, as you might have guessed, she was Jewish. Both were very accomplished pianists. In fact, both were piano teachers. They had spent a bulk of their life training young, aspiring people to play piano. They had not known each other until after each of them suffered a very debilitating stroke. They came to this, this living center. Eventually, um, they became acquainted. Their stories are interesting. Margaret Patrick actually barely survived her stroke. She spent a lot of time in hospitals and eventually a rehab center before coming to this independent living center here. Uh, she finally regained movement on her left side, but her right side remained paralyzed. She couldn't get any better even though months and years had, had passed. But she was found saying in a halting speech because it even affected her speech, and I'm quoting the way the report says, I am happy just to be alive. Yes, we all can learn that lesson sometimes. Now, Ruth Eisenberg, on the other hand, boy, this girl was a card. She had quite a wise cracking wit about her. In fact, she liked to tell this story about, uh, in a humorous way, about her having this stroke all alone at her apartment and how she lay, basically laid on the floor for two whole days before anybody was aware of her, of her condition. For Ruth, 
she recovered, but she still didn't have the use of, uh, of her left side. So you've got one lady, she can use her left hand. The other lady can only use her right hand. And they're both what? Pianists. Now eventually they, did, they got together at the center and you could probably tell where this story is going. They met each other, they found out they both had this great affinity and affection for the piano and as they eyed that seemingly ugly ancient green piano at the center, they decided to see if they could play together. So there they sat. Margaret on the left, Ruth on the right, Margaret sitting there with her limp hand, arm draped over her partner's shoulder, Ruth sitting there with her left hand on Margaret's right leg, and there was Margaret playing the left hand, doing this rhythm, right? Doing some harmony. And there, Ruth on the right, playing with her strong hand, doing the melody. Wow. And, and the, the paper actually said, they chose as their first piece Chopin's Minuet Waltz in D. And they liked it so much, they said, we've got to do this again. So they went to another song and another song. They built a repertoire and they regularly played there at the center. And then other centers found out about what they were doing. So they invited them. And then they got to do things in the town hall. And eventually they wound up on two TV programs. One playing with their good left hand, the other playing with her good right hand and together they literally made beautiful music together. Margaret said this, I never thought God would use us in the way he is using us. We are so happy and we thank God every day. Did life become a little more valuable to themselves? Yes, because not only were they able to enjoy this music, but they were able to share it with others again. They were living again for others. They thought they might not be able to do that anymore, but here they were. Doing it yet again, making this contribution. Life becomes more valuable when we give something of ourselves to others. And number two, a second point I think of is most often when people work together as a team, their combined work is greater than the sum of their individual endeavors. See, I'm, some of you know that. It's synergy. It's called synergy. There's a good word for it. This synthetic energy, blending the works together. Now you know I come from, many of you know that I hail from Chicago, Illinois. And I also know that many of you think of Illinois as Chicago. Yeah. I've had people, you know, I say I'm from Chicago and they go, oh yeah, isn't Illinois in Chicago? And I'm like, uh, no. Um, but if you know anything about Illinois, you know that Illinois is really mostly soybean and corn. Not kidding you. If you drive that state, and I've driven from top to bottom, that's the bulk of the state. Um, so if you go outside Chicago, you leave the millions that are thronging there, and you go out, you have a lot of country. And I had the opportunity as a businessman, I represented an audiovisual company, and I had to go to this fair. It was outside of Cook County, DuPage County, I can't remember where it was, Will County, Kane County, anyway, they had this country fair. It was, it was the first time I'd ever been to a fair. You know, I really stayed relatively around the concrete jungle, so to speak, but this time I got to smell that hay and the other things that go along with it. And uh, one of the events I got to witness was this thing called a horse pull. Have you ever seen a horse pull? We, don't we do them here at the, the fair? I know we do the tractor pull, I've heard that noise. But they did a horse pull. So that's where they put these cement blocks on a sled-like contraption, and they have these horses pull, and they have these huge horses. There are Clydesdales and the big Belgians, and I don't know all the other huge horses, but they're so muscular and brawny, and they have them pull these things. Well, the winning horse pulled a weight of 4,500 pounds. Two and a quarter tons. The second place horse was not far behind. He pulled 4,400 pounds, just 100 pounds less. So somebody got the brainstorm idea, well, what if we hitch these horses together and had them pull? I wonder what that would be like. Well, if you add the sum of their individual endeavor, what do you get? 8,900 pounds. So these guys were speculating, maybe 9,500 pounds, maybe 10,000 pounds even. Wow. Well, the truth is when they put these horses together and had them pull, they pulled 12,000 pounds. More than 3,000 pounds beyond their summed individual endeavors because of this thing called synergy. See, when we work as a team, the result is greater than the sum of our individual endeavors. 
We go farther, we go faster, we go longer, we go better. We go more efficiently because of that. So that, I would say, is a second lesson. So life becomes more valuable. The combined effort is greater than the individual sum. Thirdly, and this is kind of related to the first, cooperation, teamwork, together work, actually provides a sense of well-being that I think is impossible when we're only concerned with ourselves. There's a sense of well-being. Some of you remember an entertainer named Jimmy Durante. How many of you remember Jimmy Durante? Oh, wow, that's about half of us. Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you actually remember him from the original shows versus the reruns. We won't go there. But you remember Jimmy Durante. He's an entertainer like few today. You know, back then, we had guys with these multi-talents. He was one of them. He could sing. He could compose. He was an actor. He was a comedian. Um, Jimmy Durante, what an entertainer. Well, he was contacted by another guy you might remember named Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan had this incredible gift for finding talent and exposing talent and sharing talent. Well, Ed Sullivan one day called up Jimmy Durante. He said, look, I have to put together a show to entertain some of our troops. This was in the uh, mid-late, actually it was after 45, so it was just after World War II. And we had a lot of guys coming back home with injuries, be they emotional, be they physical. So Ed Sullivan, as several of our Hollywood people did, they tried to put together shows and entertain these guys, let them know how much they're appreciated. And so Ed Sullivan put together the show. He said, Jimmy, can you come and do something? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to be in town that day, but I've got two radio shows that I need to do. And he said, yeah, I know. I think if I schedule you at this certain time, you can get in a show and then go to your radio shows. I think you could do it. Do one of your routines and go to your radio shows. And well, eventually he convinced them. So a week later, Jimmy Durante drove to this location and uh, it was on a Sunday and he did his routine. So he does his routine, you know, a little song, comedy work, all this stuff, and, you know, he bows to the audience, bids them farewell, and he goes off stage. Well, the, the applause only got louder and louder, and the whistles and the yelling and all this stuff, and they were basically pleading through their actions for him to come back on stage. Much to the shock of Ed Sullivan, who knew that Jimmy had these two radio shows to get to, and I mean, he didn't have a whole lot of time to get to them on time, Jimmy Durante actually walked out on stage and not only did another routine, he did two more routines. Two more. And then he left the stage and again all the applause and Ed Sullivan saw him behind the curtain and he said, Jimmy, man, thanks a lot. I couldn't ask for anything better, but you realize that now you're probably going to be late for both your appointments. In fact, you might not be able to make either, you know, either one. He said, what caused you to do that? And Jimmy said, let me tell you why I forgot about those appointments. Come with me. And they walked to the curtain, right behind the curtain. And Jimmy Durante parted that curtain. And he told Ed Sullivan, look right there, front and center row. And there were two soldiers sitting in the front row, center. Both of them, in service to their nation, had lost an arm. And yet, there they were, clapping hitting their one remaining hand together against their partners. You see that? See, there's this sense of well-being when you have this sense of teamwork. Those guys were so happy they could clap together and they wound up inspiring Durante to come out and do two more routines for everybody. It just spreads. It's a beautiful thing, especially when you consider how we live in this Society that gets saturated with this me first, me only mentality. It's time for the world to see what happens if Jesus' prayer is answered amongst his people. What happens if we don't have all this squabble about the music and the, the appearance and who's wearing what and all this. What happens if we really focus on what matters the most and we work together as a team for a common cause? I want to go back to a statement. Look at what Ellen White says, one of the founders of this Seventh-day Adventist church. If Christians were to act in concert, moving forward as what? One, under the direction of one power for the accomplishment of one purpose, they would move the world, she said. 
Now here she is talking around later 1800s. They would move the world. Isn't that reminiscent of what we read in the book of Acts? That's basically the, the description that non-believers gave of the believers in the first century church. There was a riot in a town. And those that really were harping on the upcoming Christian church, they meant this as a put-down. They said, these people are, according to Acts 17, they are turning the world upside down. What impact? Why? Because they had experienced Pentecost. Remember, Pentecost happened. The falling of the Holy Spirit happened not individually. It happened as a group. Because people had reached a certain level of unity by the grace of God that God could pour out even more of His Holy Spirit upon them. Is it time for the church to rise up people and work as one? Is it time for that to happen even in the Puyallup Church? So I'll leave you with two stories of the Olympics and then we'll go. After all, I used that insignia. I should employ it a little bit, huh? Team USA. Some of you may remember the Miracle on Ice. Met a guy this week, he said he saw that movie six times. Six times. Other people have told me they've watched it repeatedly. It happened in 1980, February of 1980, the Winter Olympics that happened on our own soil, Lake Placid in New York. New York, Michelle. Here was this group of guys I need to tell Pastor Seth, I didn't find this out until this week. I mean, I knew a lot of the story, but I didn't know this. I delved deeper. Twelve of the twenty guys were from Minnesota. We have a Minnesotan as a senior pastor, so I need to let him know that. But they were college guys and amateur players. That's what they were. They were not professionals, like some of these other teams, especially the Russian team that had all these veterans. Our team, the average age was about 22. You had these Russian veterans who were known for their prowess, their stick handling, their speed, their brawn. Certainly the Russians were heavily favored to win yet again. They were dominating this sport. Well, what happened? Well, in preparation, this group of non-professionals, college players, amateur players, they played the Atlanta Flames a few weeks before the Olympic Games part of their preparation. So you've got a professional hockey team playing these, this Olympic Team USA and what happened? They beat them three to one and they weren't going all out. One of the Atlanta players said afterwards about the USA team, these kids are going nowhere. Hmm, that's a little dismal. Less than two weeks, 13 days before the big game with Russia, which was the game they needed to win to go to the gold medal game. 13 days. The Team USA played the Soviet Union. It was not just Russia, Soviet Union back in those days. They played them at Madison Square Garden. The score was 10 to 3. And the Russians probably would have scored more, but they were getting bored. That's just 13 days before their game with the Russians. But what happened in that game with Russia? Well, first of all, the USA team was outshot. The USA put only 16 shots on goal, whereas the Soviet Union team put 39 shots on our goal. That doesn't look good. They're outshot more than two to one, so you would expect the, goal, the score to be almost similar, but the score was four to three in favor of the USA team. Wow. In the picture, the March issue of Sports Illustrated shows this very jubilant USA team still on the ice right after the, the buzzer went off and the game's over and they know they've won it 4-3, to three, they're going on to the gold medal game and it shows this picture of all these players, several of them in the group, a couple of them isolated just on the ice, on their knees, just awed with the moment. Uncharacteristic of Sports Illustrated covers, this cover had no title to it and no caption. No words at all on that picture. The photographer, Heinz Klutmeier, a German, he was asked, you know, how come Sports Illustrated didn't put anything on the cover? It's just a picture of the guys. And he said this, everyone in America knew what happened. Everyone in America knew what happened. Do you think if the church actually answered that prayer of Jesus and became one, would the world know what was happening? Would they better know Jesus? I wonder if part of the secret of them winning that game is couched in the words of one of their left-wing players of that 
1980 Team USA, he said, we all stuck out our necks for each other. We all gave it our best for each other. I don't know if you know any military people, but I've known several military people, those who've even seen the heat of battle. And what they tell me is this, yes, we fight for our country, but when we're on that battlefield, we're fighting for the guys and the women next to us. Teamwork, unity. Final story. You may remember the 1996 games that happened in Atlanta. A few things happened that were memorable, but negatively, the bomb went off, killed two people. That was a negative. A positive was one of our USA runners was the first guy to win both the 200 and 400 meter race. But that's not what sticks out when you talk about the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. What sticks out is the moment. The United States gymnastic, ladies gymnastics team was poised. They were contesting the Russian team to win their very first gold medal in women's team gymnastics. Several of the young ladies had already won individual levels, but this was for the team gold medal. And neck and neck, Russia and them were neck and neck going into the final event, and all those young ladies knew. Six of them had been selected to do the final event. Everything came down to who, which team is going to do better in the vault. You've seen them run down the ramp, and then they jump on that springboard, and they touch the horse, and they go flipping and twirling and landing. Everything came down to that. Six young ladies selected for Team USA. Whichever team wins this takes home the gold. If it's the United States, they'll win it for the very first time. Four ladies jumped, had respectable scores. The fifth USA girl wound up on her rump, literally, in both of her vaults. So now the weight of winning the gold medal for Team USA came onto the shoulders of young 18-year-old Carrie Strug. Remember that name? Carrie Strug. You know what happened, many of you. She went running down in her first run. She jumped off that board, touched the horse, twisted, turned, landed. And people nearby heard what she heard. There was a snap. She damaged her ankle very, very severely. Something had happened to her left ankle, something that was not good. So now what? She cried out in pain and she asked her coach, do I have to do the second jump? 18 years old. And the coach encouraged her, but told her, ultimately, this is her decision. She made the decision, and according to the reports, she was quoted as saying, I went back and I said a little prayer. Said a little prayer. Simply said, God, please help me out somehow. She then sprinted down the runway. She vaulted. She twisted her body through the air. She landed firmly on both feet, but just for a second, just for about a second, just enough for the judges to, to give the okay. And then she immediately lifted up her left ankle because of the excruciating pain. And then she just fell on the floor. And then came those tense moments of waiting for the score. This needed to be a high score to overtake the Russians and win for the first time women's gymnastics gold for the team. And there came the score, 9.87 out of 10 on an injured ankle. Why did Carrie do that? Not for Carrie, as much as for the team. Wow, what we could do when we have that team mentality. So, I want to close. What if the church had the mentality of Team USA? And while we are patriotic and all that, what if we changed the meaning of what USA meant? What if we thought of ourselves as the team that is united for the Savior's ambition? What if we became the team that is united for the Savior's ambition? We look past these petty differences we have sometimes in our own personal opinions and tastes, and we focused on the big things. We focused on what Jesus died to have us do. Wow. And what was that ambition he had, that ambition he died for? He prayed it just before the cross. Father, make them one with us and one with each other. Because Jesus knew if that happens, if we're one with God and one with each other, it's game over. The gospel is spread. It's spread in practical life, not just in theology, in practical life. And we go home. Simple as that. Again, 
Ellen White, one of the church founders, said that it's our duty to do what we can to answer the prayer of Jesus. So, I know, I want to pray with you now, but before I do, I know that today I'm looking into some of the faces of Team USA. Some of you are united with God, and you have become united with your church, and it shows, and we are grateful. Thank you. My prayer for you is that that only increases. Some of you, some of you are not so connected. You know it. I don't have to point it out. You know it because God uses our consciences. Some of us have a sporadic connection. It's a spotty connection. My prayer is that you really take a look at that and know that not me, nor Pastor Seth, nor Jesus rubs your face in that. Just consider the reality of it. Don't you yearn for something better? A better connection with God, a better connection with your church? God has a place for you in this church. Some of you aren't doing much or anything. Now, unfortunately, every time I say this, I know those of you who are either doing what you should or even more, you hear this message and think you should do more yet. I'm not saying that. Don't go there. Learn to say no, okay? Because God doesn't want you to burn out or rust out. But others of you know because you've had that little ping of conscience. Ask God what he wants you to do. Because in doing that, you will have a life that is much better. Life will be more valuable. You'll contribute to the combined effort and you'll have better personal well-being. So I want to call our musicians up, but I'm going to pray that prayer for us when they are done leading us in music about becoming Team USA. Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for making sure that Jesus' prayer, just before the cross, his prayer for us that showed his true ambition was recorded. Thank you for bringing it home to our hearts, not simply through human lips, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, for me and those within my hearing, you would especially touch us, Lord. Wherever we're at in our connection with you, may it only grow. Show us where it is in this body of Christ we call the church, where it is you want us to serve so that life really does seem more valuable. We find our real purpose so that we could use this combined effort to glorify and honor the one who died for us and is soon to come so that we could have that sense of well-being, even your smile upon our lives and sense how we are gladdening your heart because we're letting your Holy Spirit work through us. Unite us with you and one another. Thank you for answering that prayer, Lord. I pray now that you would bless our fellowship, be it taking place in our homes or here in this building today at the potluck. May you bless the food that we're going to partake of so that it nourishes us according to your will, that we prosper and be in health. Thank you that when we leave here, we do not leave you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>